Oh, there you are. Today we're visiting the Center for Applied Isotope Studies at the University of Georgia. We're going to visit with some research scientists. We're going to learn about some of the analytical techniques that archaeologists use to explore the past. Come on, let's go. Today we're visiting Travis Jones at the Portable X-ray Fluorescence Laboratory. X-ray fluorescence is a great way to measure quantitatively and to assess qualitatively the different elements in a given artifact. This helps us to do what's called a provenance analysis. Provenance is looking at where a particular artifact comes from, its origin and its source. Through this, we can actually look at different patterns of trade and exchange across continents even. So let's see what Travis is up to. Oh, there you are, Travis. Hey, Victor. How's it going? Going pretty well. So I understand that you are working on a project sourcing particular artifacts and figuring out where they came from, and you're using this PXRF technology. Can you, can you walk us through some of this stuff and explain how archaeologists use this particular technique? Sure, yeah. Uh, so today we're analyzing obsidian. These uh -huh. are obsidian artifacts that were found uh, throughout North America. And essentially what we're doing is, is we're using the PXRF to analyze each artifact and we're going to get the elemental makeup of each mm -hmm. artifact. And then we're going to compare all of those to see where they came from. So essentially we're going to set our sample or our artifact on top of the XRF. We want to get the flattest surface possible and then we're going to turn the instrument on. And what the instrument does is it produces x-rays, and these x-rays are directed at the sample. And when the x-rays hit the sample, they excite the electrons within the sample, mm -hmm. and they knock them out of, out of orbit. And then another electron within each atom has to take the place of the, the fills previous. fills that one, Yes, right? it fills yeah, the yeah, gap. Yeah. It fills the gap. And when it does that, the artifact actually releases its own x-rays, these mm -hmm. photons that, are, uh, that hit a detector that is located right here, and that detector counts how many electrons are hitting it or how many mm -hmm. photons are hitting it at any given time. And it can actually tell us the elemental makeup of each sample. So this is almost like a fingerprint for yes, the element. Yes, it is. Yes. Yeah. In fact, each volcanic eruption has its own geochemical fingerprint. Wow. And that's what we're analyzing. Wow. And x-rays are dangerous, right? I yes, yeah. yes, they are. Um, <laughs> this actually produces uh, x-rays, which are a type of uh, EM radiation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and visible light is as well. But this is a little more high intensity, so we want to we want to try and stay a little bit back from it, but it's really not that bad. This is about as much radiation as you would get from a, uh, a dentist's x-ray mm, on your teeth or mm -hmm. something. So it's, it's really not that bad. And we actually have instruments in the lab where we can check to make sure that everything is safe. So, Fantastic. Safety is important. It is. Yeah. yeah. All right. So what are the results? Okay, yeah. So we're going to analyze it real quick. How do we get results? So what we do is, is once we place the sample on the, uh, on the viewing port, mm -hmm. we're going to analyze it right here and it usually takes about 60 seconds to analyze obsidian. All right. I noticed that there are these these sort of peaks that are growing. Yeah, so these are actually the different elements that the instrument is picking up. And the detector is actually calculating relative to all the other other elements what uh, the sample is made out of. Now XRF can't analyze all elements mm. but luckily trace elements which are the most important for obsidian we can analyze here. And I can even show you what each of these elements are. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, so it looks like these peaks, right here we have a high iron peak. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like we have some rubidium and strontium. We also have some uh, yttrium right here. And what we do is, is once we're done analyzing all of our samples, we're gonna compare them. So we can actually not only get peaks, but we get actual numbers that we can compare. Mm. And we graph them out and we compare them. And once we get groups of, of samples, we can compare them back to the geochemical fingerprint of each volcano and know where they came from. So what are some of the more important elements that you're seeing in this particular sample that you'd point to? Yeah, so uh, definitely our rubidium, strontium, and yttrium are probably the most important. Mm -hmm. um, for other samples, however, uh, zinc can also be important. Um, some, there's always going to be a little bit of iron, or there's always going to be a lot of iron, actually. Mm. But uh, sometimes iron is more important than other elements, uh, and also niobium, mm -hmm. and then thorium as well. So I noticed, you know, we're doing, uh, you're doing this analysis with lithic artifacts, stone tools, which we've talked about. 
Um, but you can't do this, you can't use this technique with all artifacts, right? So no, yes. what are some of the limitations? Yeah, so right now, uh, archeologists are just starting to use XRF a lot. And they're, they're experimenting with a lot of different objects and different material types. Uh, and some of the material types we found that work the best are obsidian, uh, also um, some types of steatite and other types of lithic material. However, things like ceramics, for instance, usually don't work very well with XRF. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons why that, that's a problem, mm -hmm. but one of the biggest is uh, these samples are usually fairly heterogeneous, mm -hmm. so you have to actually analyze large parts of the entire sample in order to get a, uh, a good uh, identification of what it is. Also, these sample, uh, ceramics are actually, they're made by humans. And they're actually taking things from multiple sources mm -hmm. like clays and gravels and things like that. So when we're analyzing them and we're getting a, a, a fingerprint actually, an elemental fingerprint for each sample, the problem is, is we can't know exactly what proportions came from what parts mm -hmm. of the landscape. So it's actually very hard to understand or source uh, or do prominent studies on Sort of ceramics. a signal to noise kind of exactly, that's exactly problem it, there yeah. that you have. All right, great. What are some of the results you've, you've uh, got from some of these particular artifacts? You know where they come from? Yeah, so some of these artifacts uh, actually come from Yellowstone Park. There's wow. multiple sources in Yellowstone. Um, and actually, throughout North America, Yellowstone is one of the most uh, used sources. Uh, and we actually find Yellowstone. Uh, so there's a couple sources. There's uh, Bear Gulch and a couple mm -hmm. others. And we can find those all over North America. In fact, where I usually work in North and South Dakota, which is about 1,000 miles away almost, we actually we find uh, multiple pieces of obsidian that come from Yellowstone. So that, that material has traveled sometimes thousands of miles. Yes. Um, and then enters the archaeological record. Archaeologists come by, pick it up. This, you know, this doesn't look like it's from around here. And this is the way we actually find out where it's actually from. This is fantastic. Yeah, it's great. It gives us, it gives us a direct idea of where that, that sample originated from. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Travis. Thank you. I really appreciate you explaining this and uh, helping us out here to understand a little bit about how we go about tracing this, this larger economic realm of trade and exchange. Um, it's been fantastic. Thanks.